Hello and welcome back to Advanced Composition. Professor Kent Lee here. As you're working on your genre analysis, I'll be thinking about a due date for the short genre analysis essay. And um, that will be due probably in, the, in maybe a week or two. And uh, it can be more of a semi-formal essay. It's more about what kind of things you notice as you look at the writing in your field. And I'll post links on my website to maybe some sample professional journals or academic journals that are a bit easier to understand and you can kind of look at them and kind of see what things you notice about the writing style and format and such. Uh, for this video segment I want to kind of pause and just review some of the writing issues. We've talked about some writing issues, common problems before I think I want to go over and review some of those and then talk about a few more. And then in the next video segment, we will get into the professional writing unit. And then later toward the end of the semester, as you're maybe working on, working on the final paper, we'll talk about some other grammar and style issues. So some grammar and style issues now, then the professional writing unit, and then back to some other professional or back to some other style issues later on. So I'm going to talk about some common mistakes. Some of these are things I saw in a few people's papers, midterm papers, uh, and just in general in my students' papers that I notice. All right, one. Uh, for each of these, I'm going to kind of maybe show you an example or, or, or an issue. Pause, let you think about it. So doing a lot of pausing today. Pause the video, think about it for a minute, and then I'll come back and say something about it. First one, passives. Uh, students will write something was existed. I mean, Santa Claus is existed, was existed. Um, he was died. Uh, he, it was appeared, is appeared, was disappeared. Um, uh, was belonged to. Uh, is or was died. Something like that. Uh, first of all, it's, what's wrong with those? And why do Korean and Japanese students have trouble with these kinds of verbs? Pause and discuss. Okay. These, of course, in English are purely intransitive. A, what do you call it? Tarongsa, I think, is the term for intransitive, and transitive, I think, is tarongsa. I hope I'm right there. Uh, so these verbs in English are just intransitive, and because they are intransitive, they cannot be made passive. Uh, so you can't say these things. Now, the reason in Japanese and Korean why so many students make these mistakes, um, there's been a bit of research on it, in the language education and linguistics liter literature. And I don't know if it's entirely understood, but it seems to be partly at least because the, the way these verbs work, at dif work differently in Korean than in Western languages. Uh, in Western languages, these verbs are, pass are intransitive, uh, and the subject of these verbs is a subject that undergoes a change of state or is in a state. Uh, Santa Claus exists. Um, he appeared on my roof. Uh, so exist, that's a state. Uh, it's a state verb, a verb of state or condition. And then he appeared on my roof. Then he disappeared. Uh, change of state. And these verbs, in a lot of languages, um, state and state change verbs kind of go together for some reason. So the thing about the subject of the sentence is kind of like a, it's a theme or what the sentence is about, or it's a theme and um, what we call an, an undergoer, a subject that undergoes a change. There's a technical term in semantics, it's called a patient. Uh, so if you're in a hospital, you're a patient because you're undergoing treatment or you're suffering from a condition. Well, the subject in the, some of these verbs is a subject that undergoes a change uh, uh, or uh, something happens to the subject, but it's a subject. So it's kind of like the subject of a passive 
sentence, like he was killed or something like that. And, and so in Korean, the grammar of these verbs is different. So you have maybe separate uh, uh, verb forms depending on whether the subject is an agent or if it undergoes a change, something like that. It's complicated. It's hard to explain here in the video. So the subject is like a uh, like a theme of a, a verb of state, or it's a theme or patient of a, a change of state verb. And, and so you think of that like a passive, because it is kind of like a passive subject. Like, um, he was hit, you know, by a reindeer or something like that. Uh, and so Koreans and Japanese tend to make these passive when they can't be passive, because the way you're thinking of this is a... Oh, it's, it's a subject that undergoes a change, so the verb is like a passive. Okay, it, it makes sense. So it makes sense why Koreans and Japanese would have trouble with these expressions, uh, but you still have to work on these and realize that uh, the grammar is really different in English. The grammar of verbs like this in Korean and Japanese is quite different than in English and other Western languages. Okay, awkward passives. Uh, in certain contexts, these can be awkward, awkward passives. Take a look at these and think about why they would be awkward. Now the first one is not so bad, but in the context, if you're just talking about um, the culture, the condition or state of a culture and, or how it's changed, how it's developed, it, it, it can be awkward. And the second one more so is awkward. So why are, why are these awkward? And why do Korean and Japanese students have trouble with these? Okay, in the first one, if you say the culture has been changed, well, change can be transitive or intransitive, but if you're making it passive, well, it's transitive because only transitive verbs can be passive in English. If there's a passive, it's kind of like something changed the culture. There's a something there, which is an agent, the thing doing the action, the thing doing the changing. So when you do this, the culture has been changed. You're making it passive. The agent or cause is not expressed, but it's still implied that there's a particular agent or force causing it. What is it? The culture has been changed by what? By mind control, by education, by, by God or gods or something, by magic. Uh, it, it, it would sound weird here to imply an agent when an agent or force or cause is just not relevant. Uh, because you're talking about a culture that changes, that undergoes change by itself. So it's kind of like, you know, something appeared. It just appears by itself. It's a change of state. The car appeared. It appeared by itself. Uh, Santa Claus appeared. Nothing caused him to appear. He appeared on my roof by himself. Okay, so if the culture has, has changed, if the culture has changed, it's undergoing development on its own. And the forces or causes are really too complicated to talk about here, or it's just not relevant to the context. It would only make sense if the culture has been has been changed by um, a specific force that you can identify in the context. The culture has been changed through uh, um, public awareness and educational um, campaigns or something like that. And the second one is maybe even a more um, noticeable or egregious example. The stock market ha has been increased. Huh? By what? By magic? by manipulation, insider trading, huh? Okay, now you would normally say the stock market has increased. Um, the forces involved are too complicated and not relevant here. It's just, we don't care. It's just, oh, today it increased by 200 points or it decreased or went down by 200 points. And we would maybe say the stock market decreased or fell 200 points due to investor worries or something like that. You would not say that it was increased or decreased. That just sounds strange. So, so these are 
verbs that can be transitive or intransitive, and you have to be careful. Does the passive really make sense in the context? Does it make sense to imply an agent, a cause, a force? Next, we're going to talk about transitional expressions and one kind of transition. So transitional or connected words, these are things like although, but, however, since, thus, therefore, and, then. Um, and there are a lot of them, a lot of them, and a number of problems I notice here. One with so-called ordinal, like order expressions, first, second, third, it's talking about an order of numbers. Or a fancy term might be enumeratives for enumerating one, two, three, four. What problems do you think students might have here? Okay, so the problem here is that East Asian students tend to overuse these transitional expressions. And the reason is you're probably taught, you know, to use these for your TOEFL or TOEIC essay. If you have an essay component on your TOEFL or TOEIC test, they're looking for a structure for organization, and it's a really quick, easy way to make your essay structured. Fine for a TOEFL essay, but not for academic and formal writing usually. Um, and especially if you put these at the beginning of a paragraph, it's kind of repetitive or redundant. The paragraph, a new paragraph itself indicates new topic. I'm shifting to a new topic. And so starting a paragraph with first, second, third is really unnecessary. And just using these too much where they're not necessary, and especially to begin paragraphs, it sounds mechanical, formulaic, like a formula it's a little awkward or artificial. Even within a paragraph, we don't really use these in academic writing unless it's really necessary to help the reader understand something that is hard to follow. If you're writing about something that is really abstract and it's hard to follow, or it's kind of technical and hard to follow, Okay, then that's fine. But otherwise, you can usually just leave these out and start your sentences with normal subjects. Only put these in if you really need to make clear to the reader relationships and or order of ideas. And then first of all is colloquial. So don't put first of all in an academic essay. It's very rarely used in academic writing. First of all is very colloquial or informal. So don't use first of all. Also don't confuse first, second, third with firstly, secondly, thirdly. What's the difference? Firstly, secondly, thirdly is British style. First, second, third is American style. Don't mix up your styles. Don't go first, secondly, third, first, secondly, third, fourthly. Don't, don't switch. Be consistent but usually you can just get rid of these, especially first of all. Okay, I noticed that um, a lot of students, not just Koreans, but other students from other language backgrounds will overuse but, so, and, there is, and there are. And also some of them have been taught, oh, don't start a sentence with a conjunction. Is that true? What do you think? Pause and discuss. Okay, if you were ever taught by a teacher, don't start a sentence with a conjunction. That's wrong. Look at good academic writers. Read a scholarly article or a research article you know, by a, a good or decent writer. They will sometimes start sentences with conjunctions, including these. Although we don't really use and at the beginning of a sentence in academic papers. Starting a sentence with and, it just sounds too colloquial or informal. But sometimes they start sentences with but. So, uh, and, and others. It's okay as long as you don't overdo it. But what I notice with Korean and Japanese and Chinese writers and others is they tend to overuse these. Why? Well, kind of but is kind of like the most basic or default conjunction for contrasts and comparisons. So is kind of a default or basic conjunction for cause and effect or result.
and for sequence. So instead of these, more variety would be better. Instead of starting with but all the time, use more variety. However, though, although, on the other hand, in contrast, to the contrary, there's a list of these in the book, in my course packet, at the end, the appendix. Look at those. Instead of so, you can say thus, therefore, as a result, hence, therefore, things like that. Instead of and, either also, if it's additional ideas, or then, maybe for sequence, or after that, or thereafter, or something like that. I also notice overuse of there is and there are. And again, in Korean, you're thinking itta, and so you translate there is and there are. It's fine sometimes, but it's overused uh, a lot. So maybe cut out some uses of there is and there are when it's not really necessary, when we, you don't really need it. It's kind of for making a topic transition, you're transitioning to a new topic, but instead you can start a new paragraph or just start a new sentence with a noun subject, and it's often fine. Use there is, there are too often, and it will sound too informal style. Or you can use another intransitive verb, like there appeared uh, a man in a Santa suit on my roof, there arose a noise, a clatter, a din uh, in the living room, there seemed to be a strange man walking on my roof. I also see these overused in academic papers. What might be problems here? Okay, whereas uh, in the past few years, I've noticed a significant increase in Koreans using, overusing whereas. When it doesn't really make sense, uh, I, I see Korean writers use it when it would make more sense to say however, or though, or although, or but. Whereas is kind of a, it's more, it's very formal, and it's kind of a strong contrast. Something like, mm, um, this happened, and whereas they wanted that. It's kind of a strong contrast. They did this, whereas the boss wanted that. It's a strong contrast between two things that are kind of exclusive, kind of an exclusive strong contrast, two things that don't go together. And I see it used when instead something like though, like although the boss said da da da, they misunderstood and did such and such. It's, it's kind of a not such a strong contrast, and often it flows better if you say though, although, however, but. Overusing a really formal conjunction like whereas, one that expresses a strong contrast, just uh, breaks the flow. Actually, starting a sentence with actually kind of um, sounds kind of colloquial or informal. Uh, you can put it inside the sentence and kind of de-emphasize it. We actually found Da da da. And that sounds better, but actually, comma we found sounds kind of colloquial. Um, it's kind of putting too much emphasis on the actually because it's kind of modifying the entire sentence. But we actually found it's just modifying the verb inside. It doesn't break the flow as much. Besides is colloquial. Instead of start starting a sentence with besides, for formal writing, you can say in addition, in addition to, additionally or furthermore, and such. Now, do you use moreover? Well, sometimes it's not as common anymore. Don't overuse moreover. It's kind of like an additional, uh, it's kind of formal, uh, very formal, and it's kind of like furthermore, but it's like providing one final additional argument that's really like the sum of my arguments. This is moreover, the study showed it was just false, like something that's kind of really conclusive or really strong argument at the end. Uh, it's kind of used like that. It's don't overuse them or over. It will it sound, it'll sound like you're, you're trying to pretend to be British. Uh, in case, in case of, in my case, it's very colloquial. Uh, and I know that Koreans do it because they're thinking Kyungyue, Kyungyue Nun, which is a transitional in Korean, but it doesn't translate into English as a transitional Except in formal situations, it has a different meaning. Like in case of fire, 
call 911, where that means like if, if there's a fire, in case of fire. But kyongyue, kyongyue nun is more like maybe for example, or just uh, instead of in case of, just start with the sentence, like in um, where a student wrote uh, in case of Turkey, stronger building codes are needed to prevent earthquakes. We'll just say in Turkey, uh, stronger building codes are needed to prevent earthquakes. As evidence, that's another kind of translation of, or in support, as support. Those are kind of translations of Korean expressions, and they don't work in English, maybe for example, or additionally, uh, furthermore, or something like that. What are problems with punctuation of these things? Now, these are conjunctive adverbs. So they're adverbs originally that got kind of drafted into service as conjunctions at the beginning of sentences. Uh, what are some, how, how do you do the punctuation of these? And I'm not trying to be like really picky, but it, there's a reason for the punctuation. What, what are mis punctuation mistakes? Uh, these words are preceded by a stop, a full stop, uh, a period or a semicolon maybe. A semicolon just in, makes more of a logical bridge or connection between two phrases. So gender was controlled for, however, comma. So there's a comma afterwards. So this reflects how we say it. Uh, notice how I said I'll have a, more of a, a full pause before I say however, a full break. And then kind of a slight... In, um, a slight break, slight intonation, rise or fall after however. Gender was controlled for. However, no effect of gender. So notice my intonation. The punctuation reflects the intonation because uh, it's an adverb functioning also like a conjunction, like a sentence adverb. You start a sentence, a sentence with like, hopefully we can do this, or thankfully they came through. Uh, so notice the intonation there. Well, same thing here. These are functioning in the same way. They're modifying the, the whole sentence, kind of like those sentence, sentence adverbs. Hence the punctuation, stop before, uh, or, and then a comma afterwards. Uh, second example may be more common, da, 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 demographic factors, period. However, these show no effects of the oncome. So, however, there's a slight rise, you know, and that's what the comma reflects. Same is true for thus and therefore and furthermore. Now, there are, uh, there's another option, you can kind of de-emphasize this, the um, thus and therefore, or at least thus, we can de-emphasize thus by putting it second, we thus decided not to pursue that question. Uh, and that's also kind of nice style. Uh, so with these conjunctive adverbs, especially thus, you can put it after the subject and it kind of makes for smoother flow, uh, puts less emphasis on the thus, the result aspect of, of the f clause. Okay, so in papers I sometimes regularly see people using first and second person expressions, so first person I, we, second person you, uh, and other subjective expressions. So what's wrong with these and how do you fix them? Well, you just sounds really too personal for an academic paper or formal paper, you. Or, and likewise, direct commands, anything, like, do this, you know, uh, that's too personal for an academic paper. Or even I. Uh, now, sometimes if a group of people are writing an academic paper, they might say, we occasionally. We chose to do the experiment this way because it's kind of hard to avoid. Otherwise, you can get rid of these first-person expressions, especially I, the singular I, and especially things like I think, I think that, I believe, I mean. Uh, that just sounds too colloquial. And, you know, your, your point, your idea should stand on its own without saying I think. Uh, don't use that to present a point. The points like this should be able to stand on their own um, instead of saying um, 
I think he should be removed from office to say he should be removed from office because he presents a danger to the, the public, you know, something like that. So don't sound weak like this. How about because phrases? What, do, what problems do students have here? Okay, this example is kind of colloquial. People do this in colloquial English, but not formal, formal English. It's a subordinate or subordinating or dependent conjunction. It needs a main clause to make it complete, like this. Uh, the drug is not recommended because it causes serious side effects, or because it causes serious side effects, the drug is not recommended. If you can start a sentence with a conjunction, after all, it's okay. Uh, but not, don't use incomplete sentences. Okay, modals. What's wrong with using could in the first example? We could do the experiment. What is the default meaning of could? And which one sounds right? Okay, the first one actually is awkward. We could do the experiment and found positive results. That sounds awkward. Why? Well, look at the second one. We could do the experiment if we had sufficient funding. That one is actually proper. Because what is the default meaning of could? You may have been taught, if you learned English in, in an East Asian country, could is the past form of can. Historically, that is true. That's how it evolved in the history of the language. But in modern English, that's not the default or basic meaning. It has that meaning sometimes, but just by itself, the default or basic meaning of could is in the second one, which is future or potential or hypothetical. So potentially or hypothetically, we could do the experiment if we had funding. Right now we don't, but we hope to. We want to do the experiment. The first one, we could do the experiment and found positive results. That sounds funny because you're using could as a past of can, and um, that only works in certain contexts, as we'll see. But just in a purely neutral context like this, it sounds odd. It, it, it would be better to say what? What would be better? Well, if it's something you actually did, you would say, we did the experiment, or more formally, we conducted, performed the experiment and found positive results, or we were able to do the experiment if you want to emphasize ability in the past, or, or simply we successfully conducted the experiment. That's good. Um, where could does work as a, an actual past tense verb are, are the lower examples. Uh, a, pa a time phrase? Uh, or, or at least in the context that time is clear, clearly indicated as past. When I was young I could lift 30 kilograms, but I can't anymore. I couldn't lift, so negative. So negative and or past tense combinations, or past, a clear past context or negative indication in the context, I couldn't lift the 40 kilogram bag. Okay, that's okay. But the default or basic meaning of could Without anything in the context, uh, if there's no specific past tense or negative in the context, the default meaning of could is um, potential, hypothetical, like in the future or near, or near future. Okay, word choice. Using the word grade when referring to levels of schooling, um, words like thesis, letter alphabet vocabulary. What are common mistakes that writers make, East Asian writers make with these. Think about it. Okay, first of all, grade, if you're using grade to talk about school level, you wouldn't really re use this for college levels, like um, your first grade in college. We don't really say that. You could say you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or Maybe clearer expressions nowadays in modern, contemporary English, first year student, second year student, first year college student, college sophomore, 
uh, something like that. Now, when you're talking about primary and secondary school, like when you're young, uh, you wouldn't say first grade in high school. That sounds kind of odd. Because the way we use this in English is like this. Primary school is grades 1 through 5, 1 to 6, depending on the particular school system in the city. It varies a lot throughout you know, English-speaking countries. Uh, varies sometimes from one city to another. Uh, but like grades 1 to 5, that's your primary school or grade school or elementary school. Middle school will be the next grades, starting from grade 5 or 6 to about grade eight or nine, depending on the school system in the city where you go to school, you know, in the U.S. or Canada. So middle school, those are middle school grades. And then for high school, you're not going to say first grade high school. Your high school would be about um, eighth or ninth grade. Yes, ninth grade. Uh, eighth or ninth grade, it depends, to about twelfth grade. Uh, or you can also can use the words freshman, so ninth grade would be freshman, then sophomore, junior, senior, 12th grade, senior in high school. It may sound confusing because then we use the same words for college, college, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Okay. But uh, grade refers to its grades 1 through 12 if you're talking about primary and secondary school. And not for college, you talk about like what year are you, oh I'm a first, first year student or I am a senior in college. Thesis. So thesis can be like the main idea, the thesis statement, the thesis of this book. The thesis statement is in the first paragraph or um, the writer's thesis, the thesis of his book or the thesis of his essay is that we should um, eat less meat or something like that. That's, you know, her thesis. A research article, like what you're doing for um, your genre analysis assignment. In Korean, you call that a sononmun. But in English, we don't call that a thesis. It's a research article or an article or an, a published an academic article or something that we would call it article. And it's kind of like article also in a magazine or newspaper, magazine article, newspaper article, or a research journal article. And known one, um, I know it translates really depending on the context. Uh, what you do for your PhD, uh, in your master's degree, that's a thesis. Uh, some college students, if they're in a special bachelor's program for advanced students, they might write a, do a special uh, senior year research project and write a bachelor's thesis. That happens occasionally. But more often for your master's degree or your PhD degree, that's a thesis, your master's thesis, PhD thesis, or in the North American system, the PhD thesis is also called a dissertation. Dissertation, and I think in British English it's the reverse. You write a master's dissertation and the PhD thesis. In American system, master's thesis, PhD thesis, or PhD dissertation. Letter versus alphabet, A, B, C, those are separate letters. All together they make the alphabet. So A is not an alphabet. A is a letter of the alphabet. Alphabet refers to the entire set of letters. The English alphabet has 26 letters. Each of those is a letter and the whole set of 26 letters is the alphabet. So the alphabet is the ABC is all 26 letters or Greek 28 letters for Greek and, and so on. Vocabulary is not usually vocabularies. Uh, vocabulary is kind of like the whole set of words that you know like my, my vocabulary is pretty good, like, like my whole set of words in the language I know. You don't really use vocabularies unless you're maybe a linguist and talking about different kinds of vocabulary, like English vocabulary and German vocabulary and French vocabulary. Usually it's just a collective noun, vocabulary. He has a large vocabulary. I have to learn some new vocabulary. When you try to say vocabularies, you're thinking of words. Oh, a lot of hard words, a lot of new words. So the plural countable one is words. Okay, vocabulary refers to the whole set of words in a language or a whole set of words that you know, a whole set of words that you have in your brain. Let's talk about gender bias. 
Is it okay now in formal writing or in news reports or in academic writing to say things like policeman, mailman, fireman, uh, or to assume that all uh, professors are males, for example, or all teachers are males? What would you say instead? Okay, instead of policemen, nowadays it's better to say police officers. Um, if you don't know for sure that it's a guy, if you don't know for sure, then police officers, mailman, unless you actually know for sure, oh, Mr. Smith, my mailman, he's a guy. Uh, but it, without knowing, um, you would say uh, letter carriers, postal workers, something like that. Instead of firemen, a firefighter, firefighter, firefighters arrived uh, to put out the fire. Okay, what do you do with this sentence? Each student must hand in his paper by the end of the week. Is that okay? What do you think? Well, actually, this is kind of gender biased. It's assuming the student is male, or each student is male. It would only work if you're talking about a boys' school. Okay, so what do you do? Well, the first option, I'll tell you, you might think this sounds wrong. Uh, it's not, it's just colloquial or informal style. Um, we could say, if you're speaking informally, colloquially, each student must hand in their paper by the end of the week. You're going there? Uh, yes. So you're violating the rule of number agreement, each student there. Uh, and this is kind of the generic there, which has been around in English for a long time. It's not really because of feminism necessarily. It's, uh, it's actually, I think, uh, an old... It's been around a long time, even before modern feminism arose. Um, just to be gender neutral. Uh, each student must hand in their paper. It sounds fine informally. Now in formal writing or formal context you wouldn't do that. Uh, what would be better? You could say each student must hand in his or her. You could use the his or her. Um, it sounds a little, you know, a lot of syllables, but we, it's, we, we've gotten used to that. It's kind of normal in business and academic context to say his or her, he or she. Uh, and that's fine, that's normal. Uh, or if you want to make it easier, just make everything plural. Um, all the students must hand in their papers. And that's easy. That's an easy fix. Make it plural. Pluralize it. Uh, that's the easiest thing. Now, how about expressions like someone, something, or nouns like man, woman, person, people? Are those okay, or could they at least sometimes be improved? What do you think? Well, someone and something, uh, things like that, everyone, any, anything, everything, anything, um, things like that sound kind, kind of vague. And it's also kind of colloquial. Those are called indefinite pronouns. And most of the time, those can be replaced with a more specific term, a noun. Uh, if you can't replace it with it, use object item. Uh, instead of someone say you know a person and an individual unknown individuals or something something that just sounds better more formal um, sometimes you, you need to say man or woman or person or people but sometimes you can replace them with more specific words depending on the context uh, it depends on the context so if possible you know try to use more specific words uh, males male voters male athletes uh, female, ath female athletes, uh, persons, individuals, uh, voters, Canadians, German citizens, male participants, something more informative. How about these verbs? Do these sound okay for formal writing? Or can you find something better? What do you think?
Well, these are light verbs, and they're, they're very general in meaning, uh, and uh, they're, they're fine, actually convenient for speaking, if you're talking. But for formal writing, we want to use something that's more specific when possible. And many times it is possible to find something better. If you consult a thesaurus, a synonym dictionary, depending on the context, you could find dozens of better equivalents for these. And it depends on the context. So instead of go, we could say like, uh, uh, depart, proceed. Uh, instead of give, you could say contribute. Uh, donate, yield, produce, instead of make or do, there's manufacture, create, um, devise, uh, improvise, something like that, especially for be and have. Many times those can be replaced and there are probably hundreds or thousands of better words depending on the context. Be, exist, uh, find oneself, tend to, whatever, have, possess, uh, contains or something like that. How about phrasal verbs? Phrasal verbs usually okay? What do you think? Well, just like many times those light verbs like have and be, give can re be replaced. I mean, most of the time, maybe not always, but most of the time. Likewise, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, phrasal verbs can be replaced with more specific and formal sounding words. Not always, but oftentimes. And again, you maybe can go to a thesaurus. Thesaurus is a good resource. You should know a thesaurus, at least one. There's a thesaurus.com synonym dictionary for finding synonyms. Thesaurus.com is good because it's also connected with dictionary.com to look up words. So depending on the context, for example, take out could be replaced with remove, excise, excise expunge, delete, destroy, something like that. There, there are lots of others depending on the context. So if possible, replace phrasal verbs with something more academic. Here's some words that I've seen sometimes misused. Can you spot the possible problems with these words? So, conduct and proceed. So, proceed is actually an intransitive verb, a tarongsa. And conduct is more of the transitive equivalent, the tarongsa. So if something is intransitive, something just happens, you would say proceed. The meeting uh, proceeded without any problems. Uh, the election proceeded normally. But if there is a subject agent and if whatever is happening is the object, you need conduct proceed. You can't say we preceded the meeting. We can't say that. That's just ungrammatical. We conducted the meeting. Um, the election commission conducted a recount of the votes. Uh, we conducted another experiment successfully. So conduct is the transitive version. So inform is apparently different, I guess, than in Korean. So when I see mistakes like this, this bottom sign, Inform your travel history to medical staff. Okay, that's incorrect. That tells me. So uh, that tells me that probably this verb works differently in Korean, the order of objects. So actually, in English, we would say inform the medical staff of your travel history, or inform the medical staff about your travel history. So the direct object is the person to whom you tell um, stuff, and then use a preposition like of or about for the topic. Uh, or if you want to keep this order, instead of inform, you could say disclose. Disclose your travel history to medical staff, and that would work. Disclose, like open up, reveal. Notice and notify are different. Uh, notice, so I can give a written notice, um, and I could talk about giving somebody no notice. I'm giving you notice that you need to pay by the end of the month, but that the notice as a verb is different. 
Um, notice is a verb is like somebody something gets your attention. Oh, I notice a bird outside my window. Uh, something gets your attention. That's notice. The verb equivalent of uh, to give notice is to notify. Please notify us if you plan to leave the country. Please notify us. Please tell us. And then finally, discuss. Uh, you don't say discuss about, just discuss. We are discussing our plans for next semester, uh, not discuss about. Uh, so that's a little thing. Don't say discuss about. Discuss takes a direct object. Um, there's a bit more. If you can search my website if you're wondering what's the difference between tell and say and speak. Uh, look it up on my website. I think go to my website and in the search box at the top, just type in, uh, it's kind of complicated, so if that's something you're confused about, search for that on my website, go to the search box and type in, you know, uh, tell, type in reporting verbs, or type in, you know, tell, speak, say, and I think I've got a web page there that explains it, because it's kind of complicated and I can't remember it all right now. If you have other questions, uh, you can post them in the comment section in the LMS. Um, Otherwise, you're going to move on next to the professional writing unit and come back later to some more style issues. See you.